Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Fried. I'm director of the HIV Dynamics and Replication Program at the NCI Frederick. And it's really a, a pleasure to introduce um, the uh, 2016 George Corey Memorial Lecture. I'm not sure how I advanced the slides. So um, I didn't have the good fortune of knowing George personally, but I know many of his acquaintances and collaborators. And here he is around 1986 with uh, his postdoctoral mentor, Malcolm Martin, and his colleague, Peter Howley. George was a graduate of Princeton and Harvard Medical Schools. He came to the NIH in 1976 to head up the uh, virus tumor biology section of the Laboratory of Molecular Virology, and in 1980 became chief of that laboratory. In 1981, he received the uh, Arthur S. Fleming Award for Outstanding Government Service, and then uh, at age 43 in 1987, the year that he tragically died of cancer, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences. During his short career, George published over 140 papers deciphering mechanisms of eukaryotic transcription. He had a very distinguished group of, of collaborators and trainees, some of which are, are listed below. And those who have given this lecture uh, over the past many years are likewise highly distinguished. This group of speakers includes several Nobel laureates and a large number of members of the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, consistent with this, we're very pleased uh, and fortunate this year to have Charlie Rice uh, giving the 2016 George Corey Lecture. Charlie is professor and head of the Laboratory for Virology and Infectious Disease at the Rockefeller University. He grew up in uh, Northern California, did his uh, undergraduate work at UC Davis, PhD in postdoctoral research at Caltech, and then in the late 1980s was on the faculty at, at Washington University in St. Louis, and in uh, 2000, he continued his eastward migration to join the faculty at Rockefeller University, where he has been uh, since. Uh, uh, Charlie has many honors, too numerous to list here. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Last year, he won the uh, Robert Koch Award. He's a past president of the American Society for Virology and a fellow of AAAS. Charlie has published over 400 papers in the field of virology, and he's best known for his work cloning and sequencing of RNA viruses, developing in vitro systems to study HCV replication, the identification of receptors and co-receptors for HCV infection, and uh, most recently, elucidating mechanisms of antiviral innate immunity. So without any further delay, it's a great pleasure to introduce Charlie Rice for the 2016 George Corey Lecture. Hepatitis C virus, um, and my title got, or his title got pulled. I think it's something like never a dull moment, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you All for right. being here. Great. So um, thanks very much, Eric, and uh, thanks to uh, sort of all of you for, for coming. I've had a, a wonderful day here, and in fact, uh, you know, I, in sort of preparation for this lecture, I I uh, sort of took a look at, uh, at uh, George's accomplishments uh, by the time that he was uh, in his early 40s, and really sort of the, the number of discoveries that he made and the people that he influenced is really quite amazing, and it sort of made me feel like kind of a slacker. Um, so I um, was, was deciding today whether or not to talk to you sort of more about the the sort of history of hepatitis C or cover some relatively uh, new work in the lab, and I sort of decided on the latter, because um, I, I would guess at NIH, probably the history of hepatitis C and uh, the contributions of many of the people who are here at the NIH or who have been at the NIH are, are well known. So this really is quite a, a remarkable time in the, in the study of this virus, and when you think about where we've come, it was in the 1980s that uh, there was this mysterious agent of, of uh, post-transfusion hepatitis, you know, not due to hepatitis A or B, and it was really the sort of keen eye of, of Harvey Alter, who's here in the audience, that sort of noticed this. 
1989, uh, again, Harvey with uh, Michael Houghton and his group at, at Chiron sort of definitively identified the, the sort of major causative agent of this called now hepatitis C. This allowed diagnostics to be put in place uh, very quickly in the early 90s, blood supply essentially uh, HCV free uh, shortly thereafter and today. And then uh, in 2011, um, we sort of went from being able to, to really only cure a, a subfraction of those treated to the first uh, agents that were directed against uh, the viral protease leading to a cure of about 75% in combination with uh, pegylated interferon and ribavirin. And today, um, in 2015 and beyond, we have several approved therapies that are, are really uh, quite remarkable in their ability to achieve elimination of the virus in, in more than 95% of those that are infected. Uh, so really, in terms of a, a story of, of uh, medical research uh, that has sort of impact in the clinic, this is really uh, sort of quite a trajectory. Um, and I think that this just shows you, you know, some of the early data from uh, some of these, uh, these compounds. And this shows you data for an NS5A inhibitor. This is one of the non-structural proteins of hepatitis C required for virus replication and also particle assembly. And NS5B, uh, the uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the fosibir, a, a nucleotide prodrug. And this just shows you some of the early data, this sort of remarkable sustained virologic response rate um, in patients that are treated with this combination therapy. And this is, Harvoni is, is one of the uh, approved drugs for hepatitis C, basically one pill a day uh, with sort of remarkable response rates in most of the uh, HCV genotypes that are treated. So I, I just, you know, this is, I, I think, uh, for, for the field, and that includes the clinicians and the basic scientists and people in biotech and pharma and the patients. Um, this is really fantastic news, but I just want to point out that there are really, you know, still some significant challenges uh, that are associated with really implementing this. First of all, in the U.S., even, we don't know most of the people that are infected. So, obviously, if you can't identify the, the people that are infected, you can't really sort of achieve cure in the majority of the population. The other thing is implementation. I think, uh, you know, sort of as a molecular virologist, you kind of think, you know, you get rid of the virus, uh, that's going to sort of help in terms of the association of chronic infection with advanced liver disease and, and cancer. But uh, actually sort of implementing those advances is really uh, sort of pretty slow. And this just shows you a, a, a compilation of the history of ATV treatment in the U.S. Um, up to 2014, so sort of really before these direct act acting antiviral therapies were um, in vogue. And you can see of the approaching 4 million people that were, are estimated to be infected, we've actually succeeded in treating and curing only about 10 percent of those, so not a very good track record. Uh, the other thing, which I think many of you have probably noticed in the Wall Street Journal and the Times and other, other papers, is the uh, sort of the cost of these treatments. So Sofosivir, this nucleotide prodrug, uh, when it was originally released, was $84,000, basically $1,000 a pill for a full course of treatment. So Mepavir, one of the first protease inhibitors. And if you look at the gap between the actual price that these were released at in the U.S. and the actual cost of manufacturing them, you can see that there's a big gap here. And we should remember that uh, a majority of the hepatitis C cases are not in countries that can really sort of afford these treatment prices. So the good news is that the prices are, are coming down, but perhaps not as fast as, as we would like them to be. Uh, the challenging patient groups, it used to be that uh, treatment of people that were co-infected with uh, HIV, a, a large fraction of, of those in the U.S., um, were more difficult to treat, those with more advanced liver disease, um, people with more advanced cirrhosis and so on were difficult to treat. Uh, fortunately, those, uh, those treatments, these new treatments really are sort of normalizing the treatment response, so many of these difficult to treat patients can be treated. But I guess one of the other challenges that we have is that we really don't know um, in the case of treating somebody and getting rid of the virus if that is really going to completely eliminate their risk of liver disease, and at least in terms of people with more advanced liver disease, it certainly doesn't completely eliminate their, their 
um, the possibility that they will develop liver cancer. And the other thing that we don't understand is really sort of the, you know, how the disease progresses. I mean, we believe that this is an immune-mediated uh, sort of chronic inflammation that may be associated with the development of cancer. We don't really understand how this might be sort of reversed or reversible. And I guess the other thing is virus resistance. I think as there are many virologists in the audience, and uh, the, the sort of good news is for hepatitis C, which is this amazingly diverse virus uh, with about 170 million people infected, a trillion variants produced per day in a chronically infected individual, and these, uh, these seven genotypes, that we actually have some inhibitors, like the uh, nucleoside inhibitor, that actually have very good pan genotype coverage and a very high barrier to uh, clinical resistance. And some of the other components of the combination therapies are not quite as good, but they're getting better. So there are going to be treatment failures. Uh, so I think even if it's a small fraction, you know, two or five percent, uh, that's still a lot of people that we have to worry about in terms of coming up with uh, salvage uh, therapies. And finally, I think most people believe that a vaccine may be necessary to um, can completely eradicate this virus from the world and uh, really work on a vaccine has lagged behind the therapeutic development. And uh, I think that's one area uh, where there really hasn't been the sort of economic driving force that the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies have felt for uh, new therapies, but uh, still an important goal. So um, with that sort of you know, introduction, it sort of leaves me, you know, with, well, you know, being a molecular virologist, uh, you know, what should I do now? And I guess uh, we're sort of thinking about, you know, if you're, if you're actually sort of uh, successful in a field, uh, you know, what do you do next? You know, continue or abandon basic work on HCV, uh, switch to other viruses, hepatitis B, HEV, maybe Zika seems to be quite popular these days. Um, build on the hepatitis C work, uh, but diversify maybe consider an alternative career. This might be a little bit late uh, in, in my case, or, or, uh, or all of the above. And I would just sort of make the argument that, uh, you know, we tend to overreact when there are these kinds of advances made and just sort of go back to, to hepatitis B, uh, where the, uh, the prophylactic vaccine was approved uh, in the early 80s in the recombinant form in 1986. Uh, effective chemotherapy uh, was developed and has continued to be developed uh, that will, can really sort of control viremia. And research on this virus was really deprioritized in the 90s. I think uh, the HBV labs were really having a hard time, even though there was a lot to understand about the life cycle, uh, getting funding to continue this research. And we're left today with uh, an estimated 240 million people that are still chronically infected because these treatments for hepatitis B uh, chronic infection are typically um, non-curative. So if you withdraw treatment, the virus comes back. And now we're seeing sort of a resurgence of HPV uh, research uh, in 2013 with some of these advances in HCV. So some people moving back um, from the HCV world into HPV, and uh, others really just sort of uh, hanging in there and, and continuing to work on this virus. So I think. There are a lot of reasons why we should continue to study hepatitis C. There are a lot of unanswered questions. Um, we have really sort of fantastic uh, experimental systems, including this array of chemical tools um, that has been sort of given to us by the pharmaceutical industry and others. And I think, you know, my sort of punchline uh, would be that really sort of ma maintaining uh, sort of basic research diversity is, is really important, and uh, we shouldn't we need to sort of be translational and be focused when there's a reason to do that, but uh, we really also need to encourage basic science research in the pipeline, which is really the, the sort of generator of real transformative discoveries. And so, and you never really know what's coming next. So I wanna tell you sort of three uh, sort of what next stories um, that, uh, that sort of stem from our ATV work. And one of the first one really has to do with why we can't uh, culture primary isolates of HCV. This is a sort of a, 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 a dirty little secret in, in the sense that the HIV folks can actually take a clinical isolate, put it in culture, and study it. We haven't been able to do that with hepatitis C. I'll talk a little bit about uh, RNA viruses and microRNAs. This is a relatively new uh, area for us, but was also sort of driven by uh, hepatitis C's, uh, at least at the time, 
fairly unique exploitation of a cellular microRNA for, as, as a positive host factor for replication. And then at the end, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit more about hepativirus immunity and pathogenesis, and I think uh, some promising new models that are popping up. So um, I have to backtrack a little bit on this first story uh, to talk about why we can't uh, culture primary isolates and sort of go back uh, in history a little bit about the discovery, which I mentioned before. Uh, this was a uh, collaboration with uh, Dan Bradley at the CDC, who created this pool of highly infectious chimp plasma. And uh, Mike Houghton and his group used this to make a, a Lambda GT expression library and then screened out with convalescent serum. And that led to uh, the sort of discovery of hepatitis C, which I mentioned earlier. That was in 1989. In 1997, uh, using uh, the sort of famous patient H that material that, uh, that Harvey Alter had, had produced, uh, this H77 strain, which was from an acute uh, transfusion case, uh, we were actually, and this was also done by Bob Purcell and Yen's book here at NIH, sort of made the first infectious clone for hepatitis C. And the problem with that was that the only way that we could actually test the infectivity of transcripts from this cdna clone this is a positive strand rna virus was to actually inject it intrahepatically into the liver of a chimpanzee and i think at that time we thought that uh, we were on the home stretch um, we could make milligram quantities of an rna that sort of mimic the structure of the genome rna of the virus we should be able to find a cell culture system that would sort of allow us to really sort of get down to basic studies on this virus and it turned out that really all of the attempts that we and others made sort of failed to show, to demonstrate replication from these transcripts, which were infectious in vivo, but not able to uh, replicate in, in vitro. Um, in 1999, Ralph Bartenschlager and Volker Lohmann published the Replicon system, which is shown here. And this is basically a hacked up version of the ATV genome, where they replaced the uh, protein coding portion of the open reading frame with neomycin resistance, CASAD, an internal ribosome entry site that drove production of the proteins that were believed to be the RNA amplification machinery of HCV. They showed that if you could transfect that into a human hepatoma cell line, H287s, select with G418, at a very low frequency, about one in a million transfected cells, you could actually get a colony growing up that had persistently replicating HCV RNA. We and others showed that these RNAs actually tended to have adaptive mutations. And so when these were re-engineered back into the original clones, you could actually increase the efficiency of this system by as much as 50,000-fold. So this gave us one of the first systems where we could begin to sort of study by mutagenesis and phenotypic analysis the, uh, the sort of replication proteins the, and the RNA elements in the viral genome. And we were also able to make highly permissive cell lines. Uh, the good, that was the good news. The bad news that was that when these uh, adaptive mutations were engineered into full-length HCV genomes that should be able to make virus, we were unable to actually demonstrate the production of infectious virus. That came along in 2005, more than 15 years after the discovery of hepatitis C, and it came from a rare a uh, case of fulminant hepatitis due to hepatitis C, Japanese fulminant hepatitis. And this was a case that was studied by Takashi Wakita in Japan. Uh, and this isolate is called JFH1. And this isolate had the sort of unique ability of being able to replicate in these hepatoma cells without adaptive mutations. And we in the field were beginning to think that maybe these adaptive mutations that allowed persistent replication were somehow deleterious for the later steps in the viral replication cycle. So um, in line with that, it turned out that when these uh, transcripts were used to electroporate uh, H287 cells, infectious virus was produced. Uh, this virus could actually be used to infect naive cells. It could be used to infect uh, humanized mice. And these are mice that had basically a, um, a humanized liver with engrafted human hepatocytes uh, or the chimpanzee model. And this really was the first time when we actually had a complete system where we could study the life cycle of this virus in the laboratory. So um, a lingering mystery sort of uh, from this time was, you know, sort of why don't most primary HCV isolates replicate in cell culture and why are adaptive mutations needed? 
And uh, you know, there, you could think of a couple of different possibilities. They, these, these hepatoma cells could harbor an inhibitory factor or an environment that sort of blocked replication of these non-adapted isolates. Or potentially, the hepatoma cells might be missing something that uh, these natural isolates uh, required. And Mosan Saeed, who actually was, uh, joined the lab as a postdoc coming from the Wakita lab in Japan, um, was, I guess, fairly naive at the time. And I, he sort of uh, decided that he would tackle this project that I'd been trying to get somebody to work on for a number of years without uh, success. So we usually start things off in the lab with a bet. Um, my bet was that I thought, you know, since these adaptive mutations are all over the place in the genome, probably reflects multiple ways that the virus is come overcoming some, some sort of an inhibitory factor in these cells. Um, and, you know, this just shows you a map uh, in the replicase region of the genome of HCV of the spectrum of adaptive mutations that have been identified that I mentioned that are able to sort of increase the ability of this virus to replicate in hepatoma cells. And you can see that they're in the NS3 protease helicase, uh, this NS5A protein that I mentioned that is a, a target for some of the potent antiviral drugs that have been licensed, and NS5B, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And Mosan took the uh, sort of opposite view on this and said, no way, there must be something missing. Um, you know, I was convinced that I was right, so he, he, he decided to do my screen first. And so he screened an shRNA library. Um, and uh, actually several times and came up with absolutely nothing. Um, so he got to do his overexpression screen, and this just shows you how this was designed. So we had uh, HU87 hepatoma cells that uh, were either transduced with a vector or with a library of uh, human cDNAs. Um, these were sort of selected with pyramycin to create a resistant population and then electroporated with a drug-selectable replicon, uh, which basically required at least two adaptive mutations in order to replicate in these hepatoma cells. So the sort of background of this would be essentially zero in cells that didn't potentially express some factor that would allow this to, to replicate. And then you could select for neomycin resistance. And uh, Mosan uh, was actually right. Um, and so these are two replicons from genotype 3A and 4A. Um, three different uh, sort of representations of this library. You can see these G418 resistant colonies growing up. This is a polymerase defective mutant control, no G418 resistant colonies, and sort of nothing on the vector control plate. So then the question was, well, what is it, or what are they that uh, these cells are expressing that uh, sort of are, might allow these guys to replicate? And it turned out that he picked individual clones from these guys, and every single one of these clones um, had a, a lentivirus that expressed uh, this protein, SEC14L2, that I'll tell you about in a moment. Now, the other question was, well, what about these, uh, these clones? Did they really have genomes replicating in them that didn't have adaptive mutations? And when he sequenced the replicons that were present in these, three quarters of them basically had the wild type replicon sequence, uh, which we were hoping for. There were some mutant and some mixed sequences of these. None of these mutants actually correspond to the previously identified adaptive mutations. So they think these are just probably mutations that were picked up in the transcript population or during selection. So it really seems like these, these uh, genomes can replicate uh, sort of without adaptive mutations in this background. And if you extend this to other HCV genotypes and create replicons from a number of different genotypes, we could show that if you take cells and express SEC14L2, it basically allows pan-genotype replication for all of these different genotype uh, isolates, as, as shown here, and without any adaptive mutations. So again, and then I guess the holy grail in terms of what we were looking for was, you know, can we actually use these cells to show replication of clinical isolates? And this shows you a number of uh, patient isolates that uh, were provided uh, by Andrea Branch at uh, Mount Sinai. And you can see that in cells that express SEC14L2, we can see evidence of replication over the level you see when replication is blocked, uh, basically with this very potent uh, ACV antiviral, the cladosphere, which targets the NS5A protein. So the question then was sort of how does this work? And this is really uh, still a work in progress. We don't know the answer to this yet. But first of all, what is SEC14L2? 
Uh, it's also called C6, C22 or 6, uh, or super supernatant protein factor or tocopherol associated protein or TAP1. It belongs to a family of lipid binding proteins. It's ubiquitous but highly expressed in the liver, brain, and prostate. It shows uh, there's reduced expression of this in, in some kinds of, of cancers. Not sure what that means. There are sp three splice isoforms, and it's uh, mainly a non nuclear protein. So, uh, some things known about it, but you know, nothing that would actually sort of say, you know, this must be uh, sort of the magic of getting non adapted ATV isolates to replicate. It turns out that uh, this tocopherol associated protein, I mean, tocopherol, I think most of you in the audience or some of you may know that tocopherol is vitamin E. And um, <clears throat> there had been some previous data showing that expression of SEC1402 enhances the cellular uptake of vitamin E. And basically, as we were writing up this work, there was a very nice paper from Dasuki Yamani and Stan Lemon uh, that's actually shown here. And what they had found was that some of these non-JFH isolates that required adaptive mutations in order to replicate could actually be stimulated by um, the addition of vitamin E to the culture media, and that's shown here on the left. And uh, their hypothesis was that vitamin E was actually preventing lipid peroxidation, which was basically a negative regulator of HCV replication. If you compare the results with vitamin E supplementation to SEC1402 overexpression, you can see they both do this uh, for this 877 uh, genome that's being assayed here. If you combine the two, you see a slight increase in the efficiency, but nothing that's really uh, sort of additive or synergistic. And we could show by using the lipidated serum that um, supplementation of that with vitamin E uh, sort of would allow uh, sort of replication of this genome as would SEC14L2, but only if you had vitamin E present. So it really seemed that both expression of SEC14L2 and vitamin E are sort of necessary for this effect. Um, it turns out that the sort of phenocopy that we saw with SEC14L2 and vitamin E is really not identical in the sense that if you ask what it is required to encourage persistent replication of ATV in these cells, uh, constitutive expression of SEC14L2 allows that to happen, whereas vitamin E actually does not. So there's something different about just sort of supplementing the media with vitamin E versus expression of this uh, cellular factor in uh, hepatoma cells. So the, uh, the sort of simple model that we have, and I think which still sort of needs to be confirmed, is that hepatoma cells infected with hepatitis C and these sort of non-adapted isolates induce a, a state of oxidative stress which leads to lipid peroxidation. And this is bad somehow for the formation and maintenance of a functional hepatitis C virus replication complex. And by either supplementing with vitamin E or SEC14L2, this sort of creates an antioxidant environment, which can also be mimicked by adding uh, sphingosine kinase inhibitors, other things that are going to act as sort of antioxidants. And that uh, sort of relieves the stress and sort of allows these non-adapted isolates to replicate. So again, uh, a long time sort of after the uh, sort of discovery of this virus till we actually, so that we actually have systems where we can begin to sort of analyze the phenotype of uh, clinical isolates. So the next story has to do with RNA viruses and microRNAs. And um, it's sort of entitled Victims, Addicts, or Exploiters. And this is really a story that was driven by a, an amazingly talented uh, graduate student, Joe Luna, shown here. And uh, Joe was one of these students that really sort of comes to the lab with his own ideas. And um, he was very interested in looking at the interaction of microRNAs and viral RNAs and how that interplay uh, you know, sort of might uh, sort of influence virus host biology. And he thought that hepatitis C might be, you know, sort of a, a good place to start. And the reason for that is based on a discovery by Peter Sarno at Stanford who had noticed that HCV at the 5' prime end of the genome shown here actually has two uh, binding sites for MIR-122, which is the most abundant microRNA in hepatocytes in the liver. And uh, what Peter's group first showed and then other groups showed was that uh, these interactions of hepatitis C with these microRNAs don't exert the normal sort of suppressive effect that uh, microRNAs have, but they were actually required for uh, HCV replication. And there are several ideas as to how these sort of, what these might be doing with respect to the viral genome. One, one idea is that 
the microRNA interaction with the RNA-induced silencing complex with AGO2 could protect the 5' end of the uh, ATV genome, which is not capped from exonucleases that would be there to degrade it. Uh, there are also papers that suggest that there might be an effect on enhancing translation from the hepatitis C internal ribosome entry site, as shown here. And then others, uh, and some work, uh, some recent work from Stan Lemon's lab, which suggests that this might be involved in sort of orchestrating the transition of this positive strand genome RNA, which acts as a messenger for translation, to being a substrate for minus trans synthesis and replication. So Joe was interested in, in looking at this interaction, and he used this uh, Argonaut uh, high-throughput sequencing cross-link immunoprecipitation assay. I won't go through the details of this, but basically, uh, you UV cross-link uh, these complexes in either control cells or infected cells, uh, break open the cells, uh, immunoprecipitate with an antibody against uh, Argonaut, um, run this uh, sort of out on a gel, cut out these cross-link uh, RNA protein species, uh, sequencing the, sequence these by uh, Illumina sequencing, and then align the reads either on the viral or the uh, host genomes. And this gives you sort of a map of, of reads across the viral genome and also on cellular genomes. Uh, and it gives you kind of an indirect picture of what microRNAs might be binding where, where because you get basically Argonaut uh, sort of microRNA reads and then also Argonaut cross-link messenger RNA reads. And then you basically informatically try and look, link these to see if there's a seed sequence in this microRNA that would be consistent with recognizing this, uh, this particular messenger viral RNA target. Uh, it turns out there are some other methods that have been uh, sort of designed. One of these uh, we've done in collaboration with uh, Bob Darnell's lab at Rockefeller, where in these uh, RNA-seq databases you can actually find evidence of these chimeras where you actually see a covalent linkage between the microRNA and the target mRNA. This can be enhanced by an in vitro step with, with ligase. And that actually allows you to unambiguously assign where a particular microRNA is, is binding. And this just shows you some of the data that uh, Joe produced across the uh, HCV genome, showing this huge peak at the MIR-122 binding sites, a number of other uh, Argonaut uh, HISQIP peaks that involve uh, other microRNAs, most of which we haven't, uh, haven't tested yet. So this actually allows you to sort of unambiguously assign these microRNA binding sites to particular target sites on viral and cellular messenger RNAs. The interesting thing that, uh, that Joe found with his studies on hepatitis C was that HCV infection actually bound enough of this microRNA MIR-122 to exert a sponge effect so that we actually found a uh, less binding to MIR-122 targets in ATV-infected cells compared to uh, control cells. And that resulted actually in an increased level of these MIR-122 target RNAs in infected cells. So that this virus actually by binding to these two microRNAs uh, could actually, it appeared, soak up enough MIR-122 that it could deregulate MIR-122 sort of normal uh, uh, translational and uh, degradative effects on its host targets. Now this was really correlative, and the way that you prove this is to actually see if you can test it experimentally. And uh, Joe uh, sort of noticed that there was a related microRNA shown here, MIR-15, which actually retained the ability to have some of these non-canonical uh, binding sites that involve uh, uh, base pairing uh, with other residues not outside of, just outside of the uh, seed sites here, and that you could actually potentially design a mutant HCV genome that could utilize MIR-15 because it had different seed site matches, uh, but would no longer be able to utilize MIR-122. So um, he got lucky in the sense that uh, this virus was viable, and that's shown here on the lower left, and this just shows you the ability of uh, the sort of wild-type virus to replicate in the presence of MIR-122, and then the MIR-15 derivative to sort of replicate in uh, HU87 cells. Uh, that virus is also able to replicate in cells where we have uh, knocked out MIR-122 with CRISPR-Cas9. And basically, if you use locked nucleic acids to sort of soak up these microRNAs, 
it had been shown that that would sort of block the ability of MIR-122 to be utilized by hepatitis C. And in this, you can actually see that the MIR-15 virus is inhibited by a MIR-15 uh, antisense lock nucleic acid, but not one which uh, interacts with MIR-122 and vice versa for the wild-type virus. And then the question was, well, what about the sponge effect? And I showed you this before, where uh, MIR-122 with wild-type virus actually gave you this sort of shift to the right, this increase in the frequency of MIR-122 target RNAs. And in the case of MIR-15 uh, ATV RNA, we no longer saw that effect for MIR-122, but instead saw a somewhat more subtle shift, but a statistically significant shift of MIR-15 MIR targeted messages. So it really seems that this sort of closes the loop showing that ATV is really sort of responsible for sequestering these microRNAs and sort of deregulating um, their ability to uh, sort of modulate their, the host gene targets. So um, we think this is actually a pretty interesting observation in the sense that for these viruses that have relatively little information in their genomes, it allows them to regulate sort of constellations of, of host genes um, with relatively little sort of genomic information. And I guess the question at that point was, is this a uh, sort of something that's, you know, sort of specific to ATV, or is this a, a general viral strategy? So uh, Troll Shield, shown here, um, from Denmark, joined the lab as a postdoc and was basically apprenticed with, with, uh, with Joe, and uh, has basically extended this analysis to a number of different viruses. And I won't go through sort of all the data uh, that, uh, that he's shown, but he found actually another group of viruses that had a very similar sort of phenotype to uh, HCV with respect to this uh, AGO sequestration. In other words, a, a very predominant uh, peak of AGO reads uh, in a single locus in the viral genome. And this was found for another genera in the Flaviviridae family, the, uh, the pestiviruses. And this is bovine viral diarrhea virus. We've seen something similar for uh, classical swine fever virus. And unlike hepatitis C, the hotspot for microRNA binding for the pestivirus is in the, is in the three prime non-coding region, not in the five prime non-coding region. And it doesn't bind one microRNA, it actually binds two of them, uh, the MIR-17 family and the LET7 family. And both of these interactions, uh, as I'll show you in the next slide, are uh, absolutely required for efficient pestivirus replication. And you can show that by the sort of following experiment. Uh, so here we have the BBDV 3 prime UTR and the MIR-17 sort of RNA that's recognizing it. Uh, if you introduce mutations in the genome, like those we put into sort of the MIR-15 virus for uh, hepatitis C, that should uh, disrupt this interaction and that should abrogate replication if it's required. You can restore that by basically supplying uh, a mimic which uh, allows the uh, the base pairing at uh, nucleotides three and four to occur. And if you do that for BBDV, you can see that this virus uh, with these mutations doesn't replicate uh, in the absence of basically a compensating mirror, uh, microRNA. Uh, whereas, again, the uh, sort of mutant can replicate if you supply this uh, by transfection. Actually, we do see replication uh, of the mutant virus uh, here but it turns out that that's actually a reversion back to the, uh, the wild type sequence. Uh, similar results for seen for uh, sort of LET7. And uh, the uh, sort of luciferase reporter shown here, and this is with a microRNA binding site uh, uh, in the three prime UTR. This is sort of a way that you look for sort of functional impacts of downregulating microRNAs. And you can see that in the, in the case of sort of cells that uh, have endogenous uh, MIR-17 expression. This is the level of the luciferase reporter that you see. If you infect those cells with BBDV, it basically leads to sort of derepression and upregulation of the uh, luciferase reporter expression. So it turns out that this is uh, sort of a more general sort of viral strategy that, uh, that we would have thought, and I think it could turn out to be sort of important for gene rec uh, regulation strategies for these uh, RNA viruses. And I guess in the case of hepatitis C, you might ask, well, you know, what might be the impact of, of sequestering MIR-122 in vivo? And uh, I think one of the, we, we don't know this for sure, this is still you know, sort of hand-waving speculation, but 
The phenotype of liver-specific MIR-122 knockout mice is the progressive fibrosis, liver disease, and liver cancer. So it's possible that the sort of deregulation of MIR-122 biology by chronic HCV infection is providing at least sort of one of the sort of factors that's involved in the association of this virus with, with, uh, with liver cancer. So the, the last topic has to do with uh, immunity and pathogenesis, and I think these are still, you know, very interesting topics in hepatitis C that, uh, you know, we really sort of haven't uh, gotten as many answers as I think we would like. And, and as I mentioned, we still don't have a vaccine for this virus, and we still don't really know sort of all the factors that are driving disease progression. So um, this, uh, this is a, a dog. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, of Hattie, and she's actually running on the uh, sort of beach of, of Long Island. Uh, this is our lab uh, mascot, uh, my Australian Shepherd. And the reason I show this is that some years ago, um, I got a call from Ian Lipkin. And uh, Ian had identified a, a non-primate hepasi virus uh, in samples from a respiratory outbreak in dogs. And um, this, this virus actually to date is the sort of closest relative of, of hepatitis C. And it turned out uh, when people worked out uh, serologic assays, and some of this was done by the Berbello lab here at NIH, that, that this sort of what was initially called canine hepasi virus was not common in dogs, it was actually common in horses. And so it was renamed non-primate hepasi virus uh, very high seroprevalence uh, in horses, about a third of the horses uh, examined had antibodies to this. Uh, a substantial fraction of those were RNA positive. One of these equine isolates was nearly identical to the sort of sequence from the uh, sort of canine samples that uh, Amit Kapoor and Ian had originally uh, reported. And uh, to this date, there's really not uh, sort of a lot that has been done with this particular virus on sort of the epidemiology disease association. and sort of how it's, uh, it's transmitted and the sort of relationship between the, uh, the sort of dog samples and the horse virus uh, we're still uh, sort of speculating on. But um, it turns out that I think, you know, virology is kind of being revolutionized by next generation sequencing and the Flaviviridae family is no exception of this. This shows you the, the currently the four genera, the hepasiviruses, pegiviruses, pestiviruses, and the classical flaviviruses, and, um, you know, after hepatitis C, there was GB virus B, which is the, the closest relative of, of hepatitis C, sort of a single isolate. We don't know really sort of where it came from. Um, then the sort of more closely related non-primate hepasi virus, and then with additional sequences, uh, there were pegiviruses uh, sort of found in horses, equine pegiviruses and Tyler's disease-associated uh, pegivirus in, in horses. And then a number of, of, of rodent hepasiviruses and pegiviruses, which got us quite excited. Uh, bats seem to also be sort of a hot source of, uh, of these viruses. And uh, there have also been, uh, I guess what we would have expected, a, a, an isolate in, in gibbons, uh, reported by Loke et al. in, in 2013. And even uh, viruses now that have been found in, in domestic uh, cattle. So really from, you know, sort of this very sort of isolated microcosm, I think that we, this vision that we had of hepatitis C based on the disease uh, caused by hepatitis C, there are a lot of related viruses out there in nature. And I think as many of you know, even though chimpanzees have been the cornerstone of hepatitis, human hepatitis virus research, um, we really can't work with them uh, for the kinds of studies that we want to do uh, sort of anymore. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to get liver samples from patients because people are moving to sort of non-invasive uh, sort of methods and, and extremely difficult to sort of get samples from acute infections. And the, the human chimeric liver mouse models, which we've worked on a lot, um, as have others, um, the ones which are highly susceptible to, to hepatitis C or hepatitis B, uh, those guys really don't have a, a functional uh, adaptive immune system. So, if you believe that the pathogenesis is, is driven by uh, sort of immune-mediated mechanisms, uh, we've still got a ways to go. So there's a lot of reasons why we would like to have a rodent-to-passivirus uh, model. 
So the first one that we tackled, uh, again, from uh, Ian Lipkin's lab was this, uh, this rodent uh, hepasivirus that had been found in deer mice, uh, paramiscus. And um, so we looked at that as the potential to establish a small animal model. And this is a picture of a deer mouse and a lab mouse. I mean, these guys look you know, totally different. And it turns out that uh, in the sort of mouse phylogeny, they are very different. Um, and Ava Billerbeck took some of the um, deer mouse virus and infected a couple of different uh, species, Maniculatus and Leucopus, shown here. She could easily establish chronic infections in, in these sort of uh, wild mouse, mouse uh, hosts. But when we tried to even put these in highly immunodeficient strains of laboratory mice, the nod rag common gamma chain knockouts that are basically defective in adaptive immunity, or the AG129 mice that basically are knockouts of the type 1 and type 2 interferon receptors, uh, no luck in terms of getting infection of the animal. So we were faced with really trying to sort of work out a set of reagents that would allow us to work with these, uh, with these deer mice or you know, sort of work on horses, um, which we're actually doing a little bit of work on, uh, or you know, sort of wait for the next virus to emerge. And uh, we didn't have to wait actually too long. And again, it was sort of a call from Ian Lipkin again on the phone. And uh, Ian had uh, gotten interested in trying to sort of head out into the uh, sort of parks and subways of New York City and trap a bunch of uh, sort of wild rats that were running around there. And so he and his team, I'm sure, suited up in suitable biocontainment apparel sort of went out and trapped about 120 of these, uh, these New York rats and swabbed them and sliced them and diced them and, and uh, sequenced them. And they basically found two lineages of Norway rat hepasiviruses, which are sort of shown here. And uh, they sort of looked in the sort of tissues of these animals and found very high levels of this Norway rat hepasivirus uh, RNA in the serum. Um, but uh, sort of no negative strand RNA, which is sort of indicative of replication in any of these tissues except uh, the liver. And this was true for, for both of these lineages. So um, we have begun to sort of look at this in laboratory mice. And I just wanted to show you this is really uh, sort of new data, not published, and uh, you know, fairly early on. And Ava Billerbeck has been the sort of postdoc in the lab driving this. And basically what Ava has been able to show is that if you take these uh, immunodeficient mice, and these are, again, the sort of NRG, uh, the nod rad comma gamma chain knockouts, the AG129s, type 1 and type 2 receptor knockouts, or the type 1 receptor knockouts on the 129 background, all three of these immunodeficient strains can be infected with this Norway rat virus and, in fact, establish a, a, a chronic infection. If you look in contrast in immunocompetence strains, either using sort of the original rat serum or serum that has actually been passaged in these immunodeficient mice, uh, you can see that these immunocompetent animals also get infected, but they're able to resolve the uh, infection more quickly in the case of uh, animals that have been infected with the uh, sort of rat virus and somewhat more slowly with potentially uh, sort of a mouse adapted uh, sort of variant uh, sort of shown here. Um, it turns out that uh, this is really an infectious virus. And you know, one of the things that was done in the old days with hepatitis C when we didn't have cell culture systems was to actually do reverse titrations in chimpanzees to measure the chimpanzee infectious dose titer of these non-A, non-B hepatitis samples and hepatitis C samples. And this just shows you that mice uh, can become infected with, and these are 10 to the fourth, 10 to the third, 10 to the two, 10 genome copies sort of inoculated IV uh, into, these, into these mice, and these are wild-type mice. And you can see that early on after infection with low dose, you see lower levels and, and sort of undetectable viremia. But by five days after infection, all of these animals, regardless of 10,000 or, or sort of one, 10 genomes being used for inoculation, have uh, very high titers of, of viremia. And the time of clearance is somewhat age dependent, um, sort of with older mice being able to sort of clear uh, more quickly and younger mice showing a little bit more scatter. Uh, that's something that we haven't examined too quickly in, but also somewhat typical of uh, sort of viral infections uh, in murine models. 
We believe that this is a hepatotropic virus. Uh, it has a MIR-122 binding site in the 5' non-translated region. If you take knockout mice that have had MIR-122 selectively knocked out in the liver and ask if these can be infected by this, this virus, uh, we see no evidence of peripheral viremia. And again, we can find very high levels of, of uh, not Norway rat hepatitis virus um, in the liver, uh, but either undetectable levels or very low levels in other tissues that may actually just be due to uh, sort of contamination with, with sort of low levels of, of blood since these animals are viremic. And we can readily detect uh, minus strand RNA in the liver. So um, it turns out that uh, one of the things that we, uh, that Ava started to look at is, you know, the impact of of T cells on uh, sort of the clearance of this virus in animals. And it, this is, shows you one experiment where she's used antibodies to deplete CD4 T cells or CD8 T cells, infect with the virus, uh, continue to sort of deplete these guys uh, over the course of a month or so, and then actually sort of ask what happens in terms of viremia over time. And what you can see in wild type mice, and this is true, let's just look at the, at the black six mics, uh, in the sort of control animals, the virus is cleared relatively quickly, uh, as shown here. If you deplete CD8 cells somewhat more slowly, and if you deplete CD4 cells before infection, uh, these animals become uh, sort of chronically infected. Um, and this chronic infection persists, um, and the only point I want to make here, you've sort of seen these data before, is that uh, sort of the CD4 cells come back uh, so that we see no at least in terms of the frequency of these cells, no distinguishable difference between these and the control animals. And uh, yet there are sort of the reconstitution of the CD4 compartment in these cells. We don't have any sort of epitope-specific data yet is not sufficient to sort of allow this virus to be cleared. We believe that CD8s ultimately are probably the most important infections because if you do, rather than this sort of transient CD8 depletion where the, where the animals can recover uh, sort of in the sort of three to four week period and clear the virus. If you do sort of transient, you see this delay. If you continue to deplete CD8s, uh, the, the animals remain uh, infected, albeit there's some kind of immune control going on here in terms of the infection, uh, which could be uh, sort of mediated by antibodies. We don't know yet. So we think probably the ultimate effector cells in clearance are likely to be at least in part uh, CD8s. These, these animals are immune to reinfection, so if you take animals that have sort of cleared the infection and reinfection, reinfect them uh, with virus, we don't see evidence of viremia. We don't really know yet if this is uh, sterilizing viremia. So I think this actually may give us a model where we can begin to study some of these aspects of, of HCV-associated disease. And just to summarize this last part, we have a mouse model that shows important immunological characteristics with hep C, hep B, and LCMV infection. Uh, the clearance seems to be CD4 and CD8 T cell dependent. The CD8 T cells, I didn't show you all the data for this, seem to be the essential effectors during clearance. Memory CD8s contain a secondary infection. Also didn't show you the data for that. This, we can actually establish chronic infection by CD4 depletion. And one thing that I think is interesting, and this is sort of very similar to what's seen in uh, sort of chronic uh, C or LCMV is that viral persistence is characterized by intrahepatic accumulation of, of T cells that are high in this sort of checkpoint uh, marker PD-1 and regulatory sequence suggesting that these T cells are there but they may have an exhausted uh, phenotype. And uh, Ava has gone on to show that if you actually sort of block this checkpoint circuit, you actually can get uh, an effect on viremia, although we don't know yet if it actually ultimately leads to sort of resurrection of T cell responses that are able to uh, clear the virus. If you look in the acute infection, and I didn't show you the sort of liver data or the sort of pathology for this, we do see uh, infil a quick infiltration of NK cells, which don't seem to be important for control in acute animals in the sort of um, immunocompetent model, but we also see infiltration of, of T cells in the liver, elevation in ALT that sort of correlates with clearance of the virus, which is very much like what we see in an acute resolving case of, of HCV. 
And in terms of these long-term chronic infections that are established after CD4 depletion, so far we only see evidence of mild, mild to a moderate inflammation and uh, sort of no signs of fibrosis so far. So we think this is going to be potentially a very interesting animal model to study some of the basic immunology and of this tissue-specific virus infection. Uh, it could be a platform for testing immunotherapeutic approaches. Um, the effects of antiviral-mediated clearance on immune function are something that uh, Ava is uh, very interested in. We write, right now, we don't know if, if uh, this Norway rat virus in mice is susceptible to some of these very potent antivirals that are being used to treat uh, HCV. And we're hoping that this can eventually be established as a model for uh, chronic infection and liver disease. And so we're beginning to examine other comorbidities that have been associated with liver disease progression in the case of chronic HCV, uh, age, um, male sex, uh, alcohol, uh, and other factors. So um, with that, I think I've sort of highlighted the sort of three topics that I wanted to. I'll sort of acknowledge the people that have really sort of been key on this. On the novel hepasi viruses, uh, Troll Shield is really the one that has driven this on the sort of molecular virology side in the lab, along with our collaborators at Columbia. Amit Kapoor is actually now at Ohio State University in Ian Lipkin. Ava Billerbrick has really sort of picked up the uh, rodent hepasi virus studies and is doing all the sort of immune characterization of that. I didn't talk about the horse virus, um, but we have been working on that in collaboration with a fantastic group at Cornell, Bud Tennant and, and Tom uh, Devers, Gerlinda Vanda uh, Wall, who you can see here. This is Max, uh, our sort of superstar horse. Uh, he actually uh, volunteered to test the first infectious transcripts for this non-primate hepasi virus. Um, he resolved the infection and he's protected against reinfection. Great source of acute phase serum. He was actually sort of destined to be, uh, I think, sort of put out to pasture uh, sort of permanently, but now he gets oats and carrots. Um, and uh, on the RNA viruses and microRNAs, as I mentioned, this was really driven by uh, Joe Luna, who's uh, finished his PhD now, and Troll Scheel, who's uh, back in Denmark and associate professor there. This has been a collaboration with uh, Bob Darnell and his lab, who really developed this AgoClip technology. I didn't talk about the sort of work on the other pestiviruses, classical sequoia fever virus, which was we can't work with in this country. So Nicholas Rugli at the IVI in Switzerland basically uh, did those studies and, and came up with very parallel data to what I showed you for um, bovine viral diarrhea virus. And then SEC14L2, Mosan Saeed, really a fantastic uh, sort of postdoc who worked on this project as well as a number of other ones that I haven't had time to talk about. We got the library from Jose Silva, um, who's now at Columbia University, and some reagents from others. And, um, you know, I'd really like to also just sort of thank the hepatitis C community, um, the, the sort of the people in this field, I think, have been uh, just fantastic to work with. It's been a very collegial uh, sort of enterprise, uh, a lot of uh, sort of great exchange of ideas and sharing of reagents. Uh, we've benefited uh, from a great uh, deal of funding uh, from the NIH for this work over the years. Actually, the National Cancer Institute was, in fact, the, the first one that would uh, sort of take a, a risk on us uh, sort of working on this more than 20 years ago and a lot of uh, philanthropic uh, sort of organizations, in particular the Greenberg Medical Research Institute and the Star Foundation that really provided funds that allowed us to, to do some of these things that are a little bit more uh, out of the box. And with that, I will stop, and if there's time for questions, I would be uh, sort of happy to answer them, and if not, I'd be happy to answer them at the reception. Thank you. Yeah, I think Amit Kapoor is uh, sort of the, the question was, do you see liver pathology in the rats? Um, which, without any kind of uh, immunocompromising, you know, do become chronically infected. And uh, I don't really have the data for that. That's sort of Amit's thing. Um, and um, at least I don't think there's any sort of overt signs of disease, but I think he's doing that in a controlled fashion now. And, uh, 
hopefully he'll, he'll see something and be able to sort of do the rat studies to sort of parallel the mouse studies that we're planning on. You just spoke of the histopathology of the liver and the, uh, of the rat, but you didn't really show a picture of it, so I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Is it, in the human, I know the hepatitis C is very classical. It's a periportal lymphocytic infiltrate, and yeah. it's just like, it's like a ball right around yeah. there, and it's, no, so it's, it's almost uh, pathognomonic in terms of, of... You mean in the, in the sort of acute resolving infection or the chronic infection? Well, when, yeah. Gee, you got me there. Usually, but when you see a biopsy of the of, of we'll, we'll have Harvey answer that question here shortly. No. But no, <laughs> no, no. But but usually, when you we classically like for anatomic pathology boards, yeah. etc., when you think of of, of of Hep C, you think of the big ball, just lymphocytes just bulging out yeah. of there. Is that what you see in the in the rat, or do you see a different? Well, mixture of, we, of cell? We, we really haven't sort of looked at the rat data. I mean, in the sort of mouse data, we only have sort of the sort of inflammatory infiltrate that we see sort of in the, in the acute resolving, um, you know, sort of part of the infection. And I, I think that's a much different situation than what you see in, in, in chronic C. But, and also in the mouse model, we haven't actually sort of developed the reagents or the techniques to sort of begin to look at the localization of sort of the lymphocyte infiltrate and where the actual sites of virus infection are. So this is still pretty early days, so I can't really give you a, a great answer to your question. Okay, thank you. Harvey. So, Charlie, going back to the beginning of your talk, were the price of drugs to drop to where governments could afford to treat their populations, do you think HCV could be eradicated over the next three or four decades without a vaccine? Well, I don't know. I mean, we're just not, uh, we're not good at eradicating viruses in, in many cases, even when we do have a vaccine. Um, you know, I think that the kinds of compounds that we have, you know, have that potential, but whether or not they can really achieve the sort of distribution and penetrance that would be sort of required to do that, I think it's gonna take, you know, sort of a long time. So I. I I think we, we shouldn't assume that that's going to be the case, and I think uh, you know developing a vaccine would be a, a very good sort of adjunct. I mean, I but as I said before, I mean even a, even a vaccine. I mean, if you if you look at the kinetics with which uh, you know HBV is being eliminated, we have a vaccine. You know, there are still sort of global challenges to that virus as well, and I mm -hmm. sort of go back to my my roots with, uh, with yellow fever and, uh, you know, Max Tyler and developing the yellow fever vaccine in 1937 and it's been in a half a billion people and, you know, now we're seeing urban outbreaks of yellow fever in Africa. So sort of making these things and then actually implementing them and then sticking with them um, are sort of other factors that uh, we could do better at. So that's kind of a wishy-washy answer to your, no, no, yeah. you know, your, mm. your, your sort of question. But um, I guess I, I just think that we shouldn't assume that the game is over until the game is over. Good, thank you.